Hi everyone, welcome to my channel where I post my opinions on things. Please subscribe, like and share. Um, I sometimes comment on hot topics and this week's hot topic on my TL was a certain article written by a Libyan American journalist called Noor Taguri um, about why there weren't hijabis on the Met Gala. Now, I wasn't plan planning on like doing like two Muslim themed things in a row because I didn't want to be that whole, didn't want to put myself in the um, narrow box, small box of exclusively um, commenting on exclusively Muslim issues or like being this kind of die or um, appealing to Muslims. Like, I, I'm very proud that I'm Muslim but I don't want to just speak on Muslim issues if you get what I mean. But this is something that definitely interested me, and I looked into it because a lot of people were bashing her. A lot of there was some praise, but people were bashing her, and, um, and some people were, were offering constructive criticism. I'm going to be very nice here because you know um, I believe that's how a Dao should be. I mean, I'm still not a Dao, but I'm going to you know try and be a good Muslim example to people who may think like her, and that's what I want for this video to do. So this is going to be a quite a long video, I'm going to be reading from the article, but I will also link the article in the description box and you can read it yourself in incognito mode because I'm not paying for this at all. When I first saw Prabal Gurung's Who Gets to Be American collection in 2020, I was moved to tears. I asked myself, are people of colour the only ones critically thinking about this question because our Americanness is constantly called into question? The answer in the fashion industry can often feel like we still don't know what to do with people we do not truly understand. This dress which features a sash, a, a sash posing that exact question is displayed front and centre at the latest exhibition of the Metropolitan Museum's Costume Institute show, which according to Vogue is its most ambitious exhibition to date, and yet of the almost 100 designers in this year's exhibition of American fashion, not a single one is Muslim. Also, not a single hijab-wearing person walked to the red carpet. This year's co-chairs included Amanda Gorman, Timothy Chamelet, Naomi Osaka and Billie Eilish. These culturally impactful individuals are among the youngest to ever co-chair. They do alongside Instagram's Adam, Adam Surrey, Tom Ford and of course Anna Wintour. Before this group, over the past 70 years, there had only ever been seven black co-chairs of the Met Gala, yet with a dream of dream team of young co-chairs and Wintour on the runway talking about diversity. The reality is that it is another year of this event without breaking the unfortunate standard of no Muslim hijab wearing representation. My first issue with the article is that she talks about how she dreams of being at the Met Gala and how it's all she's ever wanted and to be in Muslim fashion and I don't... I know that Muslims want to show that they have nice clothes and I think this kind of goes for men too that Clothes don't necessarily have to be very revealing to be nice, and um, in a world where we're constantly told to take our clothes off and liberate ourselves, I think it's very freeing to actually go against that mainstream um, of what is considered liberation in the West. And I understand why she might want Muslim representation. I think everyone seeks representation and validation, external external validation from outside the community to feel more comfortable. But the problem arises when you're not really in touch with Muslim values and your dreams and aspirations take you away from that. And, you know, the Met Gala has, um, you know, all sorts of things like drinking and free mixing and um, other things that are considered haram. And I think aspiring to exist in that kind of um, situation really brings to question how in touch this journalist is with Islamic values. And I think what this person needs to do is to, you know, you know, try and get themselves in touch with those Islamic values of what's halal and haram, and then maybe change or alter her dreams to fit those, because everything you think and feel needs to 
revolve around Islam. It can sound very, um, it can sound very suffocating, but I think it gives you a very consistent way of thinking and consistent logical, you know, logical framework for you to live life on. I've looked forward to clearing my schedule to watch the Met Gala red carpet since I was in high school. I dream of one day being on the same carpet or cheering on a Muslim person in a hijab, walking it, or both. Imagine there were two. And I have some ideas on whom I would invite. Ugbad Abdi, a model who has been frequenting the pages of Vogue and of whom Winter said in a Wall Street Journal piece from the beginning, Abdi has used her platform to challenge stereotypes about Muslim women and open doors for others. Or Malali Yousafzai, who needs no introduction and was recently on the cover of Edward Enin Falls British Vogue. Or Halima Adan, who was the first hijab-wearing model to sign with a major agency. Or Rauda Muhammad, the Vogue Scandinavia fashion director or representative Ilhan Omar. So going back to this whole Islamic values thing, she talks about how she wanted to see Halima Adan there and, you know, and all these other modules, models and, you know, she, I mean, I think we're missing out on the fact that Halima Adan did quit going to these kind of things. She rejected an invitation to the Met Gala because she didn't want to be in those um, sort of environments and I kind of sort of get it like and, you know you have to respect that and stop expecting us fitting us you know m um empowered muslim women in the western world mob mold that leaves behind more traditional muslim women and muslim men and i well, the reason i know this is because you know um many isocs and um, fo um forces have moved away from charity week um, where a lot of the charity dinners would have, without the alcohol, would have the similar kind of fitness, the sort of competitiveness of um, showing off your clothes and free mixing and just other kind of inappropriate behaviour that isn't very Islamic. Many of us are familiar with the torn feeling of being chosen to be in the room and still not being respected for who you actually are when you are standing in it. When you are no longer convenient to the narrative being told, you go back to being discarded and invisible to them. Them referring to the institutions, arts museums, media publications, tech companies, curating algorithms, brands that decide whom to invite to which event or onto what campaign depending on what makes for the best marketing right now that take up the role of defining to the rest of society whom and what needs uh, we need to be paying attention to. That's why this year's Met hits differently. It was never about the event itself, it's about the pinnacle of fashion, an industry that helps shape our identities, rejecting an entire group of people it claims to serve only when convenient. How someone gets invited to the Met Gala has long reigned a mystery to people not affiliated with the event. Designers and companies and influentially Winter herself has made those decisions based on certain qualifications unbeknownst to even some of those who do get invited. When I think about qualifications as a reason for exclusion, I realise I too am part of the problem. Why do I immediately go to a thought of which Muslim women in hijab would be qualified? I don't think about why anyone else on the red carpet is qualified. This is how we become critical and hostile to those within even our own communities. It's a setup. And furthermore, why do Muslim folk or any people of colour, even though Muslims not race, constantly have to be overqualified to be welcomed in any space? It's why most of us are so good at what we do. There's no room for mediocrity for us to be in the rooms we fought to be in and even when you're in the room or at the table you can never be totally sure if it is because you of you or to maintain upkeep for hollows out promises of equity oxford dictionary defines tokenism as the practice of making only a perfunctory or symbolic effort to do a particular thing especially by recruiting a small number of people from un 
underrepresented groups in order to give the appearance of sexual or racial equality within a workforce. I think there's a lot of, of truth being told in this bit about representation and this goes for a lot of minorities as well, not just Muslims, um, where we are tokenized and, you know, only used for a diversity aesthetic, but it becomes an is issue when, you know, we need to know how to respond to that kind of thing properly. Do we continue to beg for a seat at the table or do we start to build our own table and you know um let's say with this proverbial table people having food served at it where the food represents you know humanization you know if you get a seat at the table you know how are the other muslims are going to eat are the other muslims going to be invited onto the table or is the table going to be expanded to are you going to have opportunities to give food to the other Muslims? Are you, this is why you need to focus more on building your own table rather than getting Muslims on the table. You will get representation once you start representing yourself and stop expecting others to represent you. That's how it is. I understand this writer's um, frustration with tokenism. I think it's completely valid. And... I can understand why they're upset. It's a very lazy way to seem diverse um, in a place, in a setting that can be very socially homogenous. But I don't believe trying to make it into the Met's guard is really a solution. I think that you really need to have a your own table, not a seat at the existing table, in order to for people to understand what kind of diversity you're looking for. You have to really bring that yourself and you do that with things like you know with more black representation that's in the mainstream that's come after black shows like um that's so raven and the fresh prince of bel-air and so i mean i know that's a more very simplistic hyper simplified way of saying it but that's just how it really is it has become anxiety-inducing expectation to constantly think about how people are going to mess up when it comes to having you in their spaces. Just last week during New York Fashion Week or NYFW, I was misidentified multiple times by brands or in photos. When I was misidentified in a major fashion publication in 2018, I went to the offices to sit down with the top decision-making exeter editor to explain why this mistake was so disheartening. Misrepresentation of Muslims in America media has had fatal impacts on our communities and to this day we remain constantly overlooked. When I sat down with the editor he asked if I could write a piece for the magazine under one condition. I could not mention the mistake. I said this wouldn't be authentic and pitched him two other ideas that would go hand in hand. His response they would never publish two diversity pieces in one calendar year. The pieces weren't diversity focused, but when you belong to a community outside of white American, your very existence is a walking 2D diversity until proved otherwise. The fashion industry can't have it both ways. Muslim folk are sprinkled in some of your front rows at shows, finally on some of your runways, deep in your pocket and all over your mood boards, yet still keep at bay and yet still kept at bay and expected to play along and be grateful for the opportunity to check off your box. If fashion is going to claim to be a vehicle of change and impact, Fight for the people who are on your mood boards. Tokenization isn't the answer, and unfortunately, it's still the most common entry point to getting access to fresher people to open the door wider and let more people in. And letting people in isn't a favour to those people. It's a dire necessity for all of us. I don't have all the answers, and I release myself from the burden of trying to have more. Right now, one of the most important things the fashion industry can do is demand that fashion houses and publications based in France, as well as designers who show in Paris, make a vocal stance opposing the government trying to control how people dress and support the French Muslim folk who are battling severe state-led Islamophobia. Why? Because 2.7% of the French GDP is generated by fashion, and the silence by the fashion community towards French 
sent its most recent bid to ban girls under 18 from choosing to wear the hijab in public echoes even heavier as the industry continues to benefit from Muslim dollars. Muslim women's most personal choice is consistently regarded as a public matter until it comes to giving us space and access to show up as our true selves. Stateside Part 2 of Mets in America Exhibition will be presented in May 2022, presenting narratives that relate to the complex and layered histories of the theme. There is no excuse to not have Muslim American designers including included in the continuation of this exhibit, such as New York designer Nzinga Knight, who was the first hijab-wearing Muslim woman on Project Runway, Renee Hill, or Harks 4, who followed suit on the show, and Merwati of Vela Scarves, who for over 10 years has been leading the evolution of how so many of us choose to style our hijabs. This year's Met took place two days after the 20th anniversary of the September 11 attacks, 20 years after the war on terror has ravaged Muslim communities in the US and abroad, fashion and media continue to exclude Muslims from cultural American touch points, furthering the false and detrimental narrative that being Muslim is anti-American. I do not write these words because I want to wedge farther space between the mainstream media world and the Muslim community, I choose to no longer fear retribution from the people in an elite space who pick and choose who is worthy this season through the narrow lens of their own privilege. I choose to write this because after attending my first New York Fashion Week since the pandemic, I could see it so clearly on everyone's faces. We are beyond exhausted. Exhausted of putting on shows both personally and seasonally. Exhausted of how alone it feels to carry anxieties that feel deeply personal yet are caused and exacerbated by oppressive systems no one actually wants to be part of. We can choose openness. We can choose curiosity and admit we still have so much to learn and unlearn. We can choose to care about filling the glaring gaps that only build us up and we are stronger when we choose each other. Only then will we realise that the more of us who get to be American, the more peace we will all finally feel being ourselves. I could say a lot more about this last thing where she says like, oh, does my Muslimness contend with my Americanness and all that and I just think there's something else wrong with her mindset in that she's trying to there's a lot of American values that really will never sit right with Islam especially the whole hyper capitalistic thing and hyper individualism and all that and I just really need this maybe she has a different definition of Americanness but I think that there's nothing wrong with looking at how Muslimness contends with Americanness because or, or any kind of Western identity because as a Muslim growing up in the UK, you know, I, I've come to realise just how much, you know, that the system could be set up against me for my ethnic background, for my re religious background and whatnot. And I I don't really feel like I have any emotional obligations to this country to hold beyond the people I know and beyond the people that I have known um and I've just detached myself from this I don't um and I think in all it really makes me less bothered about um how um of much poorly represented people are, whether it's Muslims or Arabs or whatever. Um, the thing that really made me realise this was the last general election, and I, I'm, I have many criticisms of Jeremy Corbyn, I can talk more about this as well in this video, and in fact, I, and I, I will, inshallah, but I realised that a lot of what really one people are for is this whole anti-immigration stance that just seems to take precedent over any protection of the NHS, education and whatever, and it's when I realised that there are a lot of sections of the white British society that hate me and many others for the way we're born, and that's not something I can control, and it's something I realised that and just really made me not want to strive to be, you know, British. I, I'm not, I'm not against integrating society. I mean, I, I like living here and things, but 
you know, it, th th there are times where I do really feel like this country hates me. Um, I'm not, and I just really feel out of place. And so I'm not trying to make my Muslimness compete, um, be compatible with Britishness or whatever. You know, that's for white British Muslims to do or anyone else who wants to have really has roots settled down here so that's the end of my video um i know my video is that um the lighting suddenly changed that to pray maghrib and eat um so it's really dark now um inshallah i'll finish editing this video but if you do like this please um share like and subscribe um and thank you for watching. All relevant links to social media and stuff are in the description box as well as the link to the article that I talked about.